Good evening, my dear friends. We, the Zoom players hailing from such lands as New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Louisiana, present to you Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. We begin. First act, morning robe in Algernon's flat in Half Moon Street. The room is luxuriously and artistically furnished. The sound of a piano is heard in the adjoining room. Lane is arranging afternoon tea on the table and after music has ceased, Algernon enters. Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches for late, cut for Lady Brecknell? Yes, sir. He hands them a salver. Algernon inspects them, takes two, and sits down on the sofa. Oh, uh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shorman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed? Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is that at a bachelor's establishment the servants invariably drink the champagne? I, I merely ask for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of first-rate brand. Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I am much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I am sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane goes out. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Enter Lane. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Enter Jack. Lane goes out. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you to town? A well, pleasure. Pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. I believe it's customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? Sitting down on the sofa. In the country. What on earth do you do there? When, one is gloves. when one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Got nice neighbors in your pot of Shropshire? <laughs> Perfectly horrid, never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, uh, Shropshire is your country, is it not? Uh, Shropshire? Well, yes, of course. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance and one so young? Who is coming to tea? Oh, uh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. Oh, how perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of you being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It's very romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted, one usually is, I believe, and then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, there is no use speculate, speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Jack puts out his hand to take a sandwich. Algernon at once interferes. Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specifically for Aunt Augusta. He takes one and eats it. Well, you have been eating them all the time. That is a quite a different matter. She is my aunt. Takes a plate from below. Have some bread and butter. 
the bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. And yeah. very good bread and butter it is too. Well, my dear fellow, uh, you need not eat as if you were going to eat at all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. <laughs> that is nonsense. It isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for all the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. He rings the bell. Cecily? What do you mean? What do you mean algae by Cecily? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. Enter Lane. Bring me that, that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say you have had my cigarette case all this time? I wish, I wish to goodness you had let me know. I have been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hand up. <laughs> there is no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. Enter Lane with a cigarette case on a salver. Algernon takes it at once. Lane goes out. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. However, it makes no matter for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You have seen me with it a hundred times and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, uh, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from some of, someone of the name of Cecily, and you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is, too. Lives at Turnford Wells. D just give it back to me, Algy. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily with her fondest love. Moving to sofa and kneeling upon it. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt, and that is absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. He follows Algernon around the room. Yes, but why does your aunt call her, you her uncle? From little Cecily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle? I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest looking per person I've ever saw in my life. It is perfectly absurd that you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the opening. I'll keep this as proof that your name is Ernest if ever you attempt to deny it to me or Gwendolyn or to anyone else. Puts the cards in his pocket. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. And the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small aunt, Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come on, old boy, you have much better than have the thing out at once. Uh, my dear Algy, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. It is very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now go on, tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I've always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret bunbeast. I am quite sure of it now. 
Bunburyist? What on earth do you mean by a Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you're kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in the town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. And cigarette case? Now produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. He sits on the sofa. My dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. Let me tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bumburied it all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth, plain and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to the people who have been at the university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are are bumbiest. I was quite right in saying that you are a Bunburyist. Uh, you are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest, in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down to the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight for I've been really engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It is very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dined there on Monday. Once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I'm always treated as a member of the family and sent down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flips with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who foot with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's own clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. In indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. Just rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr. with your invalid friend who has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to be me extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who carries who marries knowing without Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, she is the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. 
for heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There is such a lot of beastly competition about it. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Hungarian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Bully's? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It is so shallow of them. Enter Lane. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Algernon goes forward to meet them. Enter Lady Bracknell and Gwendolyn. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I am feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. <laughs> That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Jack sees, uh, sees Jack and bows to him with icy coldness. Dear me, you are smart. I am always smart, am I not, Mr. Worthing? You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. Uh, Gwendolyn and Jack sit down together in the corner. I am sorry if we are a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Well, won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. He picks up an empty plate in horror. Good heavens, Lane. Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. It really that makes no matter. Oh. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Goes out. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers. Not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I, I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who, who seemed to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its colour. From what cause, I of course cannot say. Algernon crosses and hands him tea. Thank you. I have quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I am going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, that I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. It is a great ball, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me, but the fact is I have just had a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It's very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, uh, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. <laughs> well, I must say, Algernon, but I think it's high time that Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. This silly shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice. As far as any improvement in his element goes, I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely you on you to arrange new my music for me. It is my last reception and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season, when everyone has particularly said whatever they had to say. 
which in most cases was probably too much, not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, and if he's still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right on by Saturday, uh, of course the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out, and if you will kindly come into the next room for a moment. Uh, thank you, Algernon. Very thoughtful of you. Rising and following, Algernon. I'm sure the program will be delightful. After a few expurgations, French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed I believe is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Lady Bracknell and Algernon go into the music room. Gwendolyn remains behind. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Reading. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else, and that makes me nervous. <laughs> I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly in a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. Yes, I am quite well aware of the fact, and I often wish that in public at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was a far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is, constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines, has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told, and my ideal has always been to love some, someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. <sighs> Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest? But your name is Ernest. Uh, yes, I know it is, but supposing it was something else. Do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Ah. Uh. That is clearly a metaphysical speculation, and like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Personally, darling, to, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It's, it's a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? No, there's very little music in the name of Jack, if any at all, indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Uh, well, surely. You, you know that I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity, and to spare you of any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthington, I think it's only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept. Gwendolyn! 
Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? You know what I have got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long have you been about it? I am afraid you have had very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I have, I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderful blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. Enter Lady Bracknell. Mr. Worthing, why, sir, from, from this semi recumbent posture, it is most indecorous. I must beg you re to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Miss Mama. Pardon me. Oh. Pardon me. You are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It's hardly a matter that she should be, could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I'm making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn! Mm. Gwendolyn, goes, Gwendolyn. Oh. Gwendolyn goes to the door. She and Jack blow kisses to each other behind Lady Bracknell's back. Lady Bracknell looks vaguely about as if she could not understand what the noise was. Finally turns round. Gwendolyn, the carriage! <sighs> yes, Mama! You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. She looks in her pocket for a notebook and pencil. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men, though I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? 29. Ah, a very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? Uh, I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prov prove a serious dangers to the upper class, and probably to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. Hmm. In land or investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and, and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people who make anything out of it. A country house? Hmm. How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Blossom. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like at six months' notice. Lady Blossom? I don't know her. 
Oh, she goes about very little. She is a lady considerably advanced in years. Oh, nowadays there is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. Oh. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary. I presume. What are your politics? <laughs> well, I'm afraid I really have none. I, I, I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as toys. They dine with us. Or come in the evening, at any rate. Now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may, may be regarded as a misfortune. To, to lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers called the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I, I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I, I don't actually know who I am. I, Birth, I, 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 well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing. Because he happened to have a first class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex, it is a seaside resort. Where did this charitable gentleman who had a first class ticket for the seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I was in a handbag, a somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did Mr. James or, or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or, or at any rate bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me that to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the, excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate mo movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, has probably indeed been used for that purpose from before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it got to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel? Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Lady Bracknell sweeps out in majestic indignation. Good morning. Algernon from the other room strikes up the wedding march. Jack looks perfectly furious and goes to the door. For goodness sake, don't play that ghastly tune, Algy. How idiotic you are. The music stops and Algernon enters cheerily. Didn't it go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you. I know it is the way she has, as she is always refusing people. I think it most ill-natured of her. Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable, never met such a gorgon. I don't really know what a gorgon is like, but I am quite sure that Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing about my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. 
relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct about when to die. That is nonsense. Isn't it? Oh, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. That is exactly what things were originally made for. <sighs> Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't think there's any chance of Gwendolyn being coming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Algy? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased. And quite as true as any observation in civilized life should be. I am sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools? Oh, uh, about the clever people, of course. What fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her. If she is pretty and someone else, she is plain. That is nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profl profligate Ernest? Before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's a sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say a severe chill. You're sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? Of course it isn't. Very well, then. My poor brother Ernest to carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. Well, I thought you said that Miss Cardia was a little... Too much interested in your poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? That is all right. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I am glad to say. She has got a capital appetite, goes long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would uh, rather like to see Cecily. I will take very good care you never do. She is excessively pretty, and she is only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who's only just 18? <laughs> One doesn't blurt these things out to people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that half an hour after they have met, they will be cutting each other's sister. Women only do that when they have called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and dress. Do you know when it is nearly seven? Oh, it always is nearly seven. Well, I am hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. What shall we do after dinner? Go to a theater? Oh, no, I loathe listening. Well, let us go to the club. No, I hate talking. Well, we might trot around the Empire at ten. No, I, I can't bear looking at things. It is so silly. Well, what shall we do? Nothing. It is awfully hard work doing nothing. However, I don't mind hard work when there is no definite object of any kind. Miss Fairfax. Enter what? Gwendolyn, Lane goes out. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Melanie. She's not here. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Sorry, Melanie. I just disappeared. Oh my gosh, hold on. We are at Ernest, we, we may never be married at the bottom of page 25. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regards to what their 
their children say to them, the old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mamma, I lost at the age of three. But although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, I may marry someone else, and marry often. Nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn. <gasps> The story of your romantic origin is as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. My own one. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn around now. Thanks. I've turned around already. You may also ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. Jack and Gwendolyn go off. Lane presents several letters on a salver to Algernon. It, it is to be surmised that they are bills, as Algernon, after looking at the envelopes, tears them up. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going Bunbury. Yes, sir. I shall probably be, be not be back till Monday. Uh, you can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the Bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you are uh, a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. Enter Jack. Lane goes off. It's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. What on earth are you so amused at? Oh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that's all. <laughs> if you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only things that are never serious. That's nonsense, Algy. You never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. Jack looks indignantly at him and leaves the room. Algernon lights a cigarette, reads his shirt cuff, and smiles. Act drop. Second act. Scene. Garden at the manor house. A flight of gray stone steps leads up to the house. The garden, an old-fashioned one, full of roses. Time of year, July. Basket chairs and a table covered with books are under a large yew tree. Miss Prism discovered seated at the table. Cecily is at the back, watering flowers. Cecily, Cecily, surely such a util utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Moulton's duty than yours, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it to page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as, uh, as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and, trivia and triviality would be out of place in, in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about th that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I am sure you certainly would. You know, German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not. Cecily begins to write in her diary. 
I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and, and vacillating. Indeed, I am not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three volume novels that Mude sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three volume novel, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see Dr. Charnable coming up through the garden. Dr. Chasuble, oh, this is indeed a pleasure. Enter, Ch enter Canon Chasuble. How are we this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well? Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the director came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I am afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. I, I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet? We do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes, he usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He's not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man, his brother, seems to be. But I must not disturb Agiria or her pupil any longer. Agiria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical illusion merely, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong? I think, dear Doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. Uh, Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Goes down the garden with Dr. Chasuble. Horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German. Enter Merriman with a card on a salver. Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother! Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. Merriman goes off. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I am so afraid he will look just like everyone else. Enter Algernon, very gay and debonair. He does. Raising his hat. You are my little cousin, Cecily, I am sure. You are under some strange mistake. I'm not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. Algernon is rather taken aback. But I am your cousin, Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother, my cousin Ernest, my wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I, I'm not really wicked at all, cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Looks at her uh, amazement. Uh, uh, 
Uh, of course, I have been rather reckless, sir. I am glad to hear it. In fact, you now you may mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I am sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. Uh, that is a great disappointment. I am obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, uh, the appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wishes, wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak to you about your in, in, immigrating. About my what? Your immigrating. He has gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh, well. The accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. <sighs> I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather Quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. That is because I'm hungry. How thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, might I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A Marcel Miel? No, I'd sooner have a pink nose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. Cecily puts the rose in his buttonhole. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. They pass into the house. Miss Prism and Dr. Chasuble return. You are too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. A misanthrope I can understand. A womanthrope never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctively against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often, I've been told, not even to her. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. But where is Cecily? Perhaps she follows to the schools. Enter Jack slowly from the back of the garden. He is dressed in the deepest mourning with, cr with crepe hatband and black gloves. Mr. Worthing! Mr. Worthing? This is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. Shakes Miss Prism's hand in a tragic manner. I have returned sooner than I expected. Dr. Chaucible, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful depths and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure? Dead. Your brother Ernest is dead? Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you were always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, 
sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No, he died abroad in Paris. In fact, I, I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Charity, my dear Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly, peculiarly susceptible to drafts. Will the interment take place here? No, it seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I feel that hardly points to any serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt wish me to make some light, slight allusion to the tragic domestic affliction next Sunday? Jack presses his hand convulsively. My sermon on the meaning of manna in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion, joyful or as in the present case, distressing. I have preached it all harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations on days of humiliation and festal days. <clears throat> the last time I delivered it was at the cathedral as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society for the Prevention of Discontent Among the Upper Orders. The bishop who was present was struck by some of the analogies I drew. Oh, th that reminds me. You mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Chaucerble. I suppose you know how to christen all right. I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. Is there any particular infant for whom you're interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. Oh, but it is not for any child, dear doctor. I am very fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already? I don't remember anything about it. But have you any grave doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way, or if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all. The sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehensions. Sprinkling is all that is necessary, or indeed I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. At what hour would you wish this ceremony performed? I might trot round about five if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at the time, a case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages at your own estate. Poor Jenkins, the, the, the harder and most hardworking man. Oh, no, I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. Would half past five do? Admirably, admirably. And now, my dear Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into the house of sorrow. I would merely beg you not to be much bowed down by grief. What seems to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Enter Cecily from the house. Uncle Jack, oh, I am pleased to see you back. But what horrid clothes you have got on. Do go and change them. Cecily! My child, my child. Cecily goes toward Jack. He kisses her on the brow in a melancholy manner. What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you had a toothache, and I have got such a surprise for you. Why do you, who, who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother, Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense, I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? One's back to the house. These are very joyful tidings. After we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me particularly particularly distressing. My brother is in the dining room? I don't know what it all means. I think it is perfectly absurd. Enter Algernon and Cecily hand in hand. They come slowly up to Jack. Good heavens! Motions Algernon away. Brother John, I have come down to tell you, come down from town to tell you that I'm very sorry for all the trouble I've given you and that I intend to take to lead a better life in the future. Jack glares at him and does not take his hand. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming down here, disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There's some good in everyone. 
Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, has, he has been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury. Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury, about anything else. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit that the thoughts were all on my side. But I must say that I think that Brother John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. I expect a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I've come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. Shakes with Algernon and glares. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. They all go off except Jack and Algernon. You young scoundrel. Alger, you must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bunburying here. Enter Merriman. I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. Goes back into the house. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go up and change? It is perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who is actually staying for a whole week with you in your house as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. I certainly won't leave you so long as you are in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I should think it a very unkind if you didn't. Or will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you're not too long. I never saw anybody take so long to dress and with such little result. Well, at any rate, that is better than being always overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. Your, your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct in outrage, and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you have got to catch the 4-5, and I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to town. This bunburying, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. Goes into the house. Uh, I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and uh, that is everything. Enter Cecily at the back of the garden. She picks up the can and begins to water the flowers. But I must see her before I go and make arrangements for another bunbury. Ah, oh, there she is. Oh, I nearly came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then we have got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people one, whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a momentary separation from anyone whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. Enter Merriman. The dog cat is at the door, sir. Algernon looks appealingly at Cecily. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. Exit, Merriman. I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I stay quite frankly that 
and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Goes over to the table and begins writing in diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to take a look at it. Uh, may I? Oh, no. Hand over it. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I am quite ready for more. <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Right, as Algernon speaks. Uh, Cecily, ever since I first looked upon your wonderfully and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you with wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. I don't think you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. Enter Merriman. The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Looks at Cecily, who makes no sign. Yes, sir. Merriman retires. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care for anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. Will you marry me? Won't you? You silly boy. Of course. Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. <laughs> for the last three months? Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Pism. And, of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him, after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling, uh, and when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other, and after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under the dear old tree here. The next day, I brought this little ring in your name, and this is the little bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? Uh, it's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for you leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. Kneels at table, opens box, and produces letters tied up with a blue ribbon. My letters? But my own sweet Cecily, I have never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But our engagement, was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was, on the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you like. Uh, today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. But why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? I had done nothing at all, Cecily. I am very much hurt that you, to, to, indeed, to hear you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. It would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once, but I forgave you before the week was out. Crossing to her and kneeling. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. He kisses her. She puts her fingers through his hair. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Uh, yes, darling, with a little help from others. I am so glad. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily? I don't think I could break it off now that I have actually met you. Besides, of course, there's the question of your name. Yes, of course. You must not laugh at me, darling, but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. 
Algernon Rises, Cecily also. There's something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. Uh, but my dear child, do you mean to say that you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, any name you like. Uh, Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, living little darling, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It's not at all a bad name. In fact, it's a rather aristocratic name. Half the, of the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. But seriously, <laughs> Cecily, if my name was Algie, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But I fear that I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. <clears throat> Cecily, no, your record is here. Uh, I suppose thoroughly experienced in the practice of all the rites and ceremonials of the church? Oh yes, Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on a most important christening. I, I mean on a most important business. Oh. I shan't be away more than half hour. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th and that I only met you today for the first time, I think it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. Kisses her and rushes down the garden. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much, I must enter his proposal in my diary. Enter Merriman. Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthing. On very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in the library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Pray ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon. And you can bring tea. Yes, miss. Goes out. Miss Fairfax, I suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. Enter Merriman. Miss Fairfax. Enter Gwendolyn. Exit Merriman. Cecily advancing to meet her. Pray, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. Something tells me that we're going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. Perhaps this might be a favorable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You have never heard of Papa, I suppose? I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I'm glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me to has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. Is it part of her system? It is part of her system. So do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I am very fond of being looked at. You are here on short visit, I suppose? Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also? Oh, no. I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, it is strange he never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I am not sure, however, that the, new, the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. 
Uh, I'm very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish you were, well, just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly... Oh. Did I skip something? Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> pray do, I think that whatever, whenever, pray do, I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is bro his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I am sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Oh, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention of his, mention his brother. The subject seems dis distasteful to most men. Cecily, you have lifted a load off my mind. I was growing almost anxious. I would, be, would have been terrible if any cloud had come over our friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. Quite sure. In fact... I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make it a, se a secret of it to you. Our little country newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. My darling Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I am afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. Cecily uh, shows her diary, which Gwendolyn examines. Uh, it is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. Produces her own diary. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish, but I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more, more than... A moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? There's, this is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. Yeah, I am glad to say that I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our so social spheres have been wi widely different. Enter Merriman, followed by the footman. He carries a salver, tablecloth, and plate stand. Cecily is about to retort. The presence of the servants exercises a restraining influence, under which both girls change. Shall I lay the tea here as usual, miss? Yes, as usual. Merriman begins to clear the table and lay cloth. A long pause. Cecily and Gwendolyn glare at each other. Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills, quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? 
Oh, I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. Gwendolyn bites her lip and beats her foot nervously with her parasol. Quite a well-kept garden this is, Mrs. Cardo. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country, if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl, but I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Cecily looks angry at her, takes up the tongs, and put four lumps of sugar into the cup. Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is a rarely seen as at the best houses nowadays. Cuts a very large slice of cake and puts it on the tray. Hand that to Miss Fairfax. Merriman does so and goes out with footmen. Gwendolyn drinks the tea and makes a grimace. Puts down the cup, reaches out her hand to the bread and butter, looks at it and finds it is cake. Rises in indignation. Oh, you have filled my tea with lumps of sugar, and though I asked most distinctly for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardo, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lengths in which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such a matter. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in this neighborhood. Enter Jack. Gwendolyn catches sight of him. Ernest, my own Ernest. Gwendolyn, darling offers to kiss her. Gwendolyn draws back. A moment. May I ask if you are engaged to be married to this young lady? <laughs> the dear little Cecily, of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. Offers her cheek. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon. This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh. Enter Algernon. Here is Ernest. Algernon goes straight over to Cecily without noticing anyone else. My own love. Offers to kiss her. A moment, Ernest. May I ask you... Are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn! Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I mean to Gwendolyn. <laughs> of course not! What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. Presenting her to be kissed? You may. Algernon kisses her. I felt there was some slight error, Miss Cardo. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Montcrief. Breaking Alger away from Algernon. Algernon Montcrief? Oh! The two girls move towards each other and put their arms around each other's waists as if for protection. Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh! Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. But my name certainly is John. It has been John for years. Uh, a gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? They embrace. Jack and Algernon groan and walk up and down. 
<laughs> there is just one question I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea. Mr. Worthing, there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life that I have ever been reduced to such a painful position. And I'm really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. I never had a brother in my life, and I certainly have not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. I am afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl suddenly to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? They retire to the house with scornful looks. This ghastly state of things is what you call bunburying, I suppose. Yes, and a perfectly wonderful bunbury it is. It is the most wonderful bunbury I've ever had in my life. Well, you've no right whatsoever to bunbury here. That is absurd. One has a right to bunbury any way one chooses. Every serious bunbury knows that. Serious bunbury is good heavens. Well, one must be serious about something, if one wants to have any amusement in life. I happen to be serious about bumbering. What on earth are you serious about? I haven't got the remotest idea. About everything, I should fancy. You have such an absolutely trivial nature. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. You won't be able to run down to the country quite so often as you used to, dear Alty, and a very good thing, too. Your brother is a little off color, isn't he, Jack? dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear to London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was. And not a bad thing, either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I must say that your taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable, to say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defiance at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, that is all. I love her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of your marrying Miss Cartu. I don't think there is much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax being united. Well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. Begins to eat muffins. It's a very vulgar to talk about one's business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and then merely at dinner parties. How can you sit there calmly eating muffins when we're in this horrible trouble I can't make out? You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get on my cuffs. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. It is the only way to eat them. I say it's perfectly heartless you're eating muffins at all under the circumstances. When I'm in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed, when I am in really great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately will tell you, I refuse everything except food and drink. At the present moment, I am eating muffins because I am unhappy. Besides, I am particularly fond of muffins. Well, that is no reason why you should eat them at all in this greedy way. Takes muffins from Algernon. Algernon offers tea cake. I wish you would have tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens, I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you have just said it was a perfectly heartless to, can, to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you, under the circumstances. That is a very different thing. That may be. But the muffins are the same. He seizes the muffin dish back from Jack. Algy, I wish to goodness you would go. You can't possibly ask me to go without having some dinner. It's absurd. I never go any without my dinner. No one ever does, except for vegetarians and people like that. 
Besides, I have just made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened myself at 5.30, and I naturally will take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened Ernest. It's absurd. Besides, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There is no evidence at all that I have ever been christened by anybody. I should think it extremely probable I never was, and so does Dr. Chasuble. It is entirely different in your case. You have been christened already. Yes, but I have not been christened for years. Yes, but you have been christened. That is the important thing. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you are not quite sure about your ever having been christened, I must, I must say that I think it rather dangerous you're venturing on it now. It might make you very unwell. You can hardly have forgotten that someone very closely connected with you was very nearly carried off this week in Paris by a severe chill. Yes, but you said yourself that a severe chill was not hereditary. It used to be, I know, but I dare say it is now. Science is always making wonderful improvements in things. That is nonsense. You are always talking nonsense. Jack, you are at the muffin again? I wish you wouldn't. There are only two left. Take the muffins back. I told you I was particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. Why on earth do you allow tea cake to be served for your guests? What ideas do you have of hospitality? Algy, Algernon, I have already told you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. And there is still one muffin left. Jack groans and sinks into a chair. Algernon still continues eating. Act drop, end of act two. Third act, scene. Morning room at the manor house. Gwendolyn and Cecily are at the window looking on, you know, onto the garden. The fact that they did not follow us at once into the house as anyone else would have done seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. Repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? But they haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery. They're approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. Enter Jack, followed by Algernon. They whistle some dreadful popular air from a British opera. This dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing, have I, I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems like a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't, but that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. <laughs> Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes, I, I mean no. True, I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time from me? Certainly. Gwendolyn beats time with uplifted finger. Your Christian, Christian names name are still, still an insuperable barrier. That, that is all. Our, Our Christian, Christian names, names is, is that, that all? all? But we are, we going, are going to be, to be Christian, Christian this, this afternoon. afternoon. For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. 
it please me you are ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely, infinitely beyond us. We are. Clasps hands with Algernon. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. Darling. They fall into each other's arms. Enter Merriman. When he enters, he coughs loudly, seeing the situation. <laughs> Lady Brecknell. Good heavens! Enter Lady Bracknell. The couple separate in alarm. Enter Merriman. Simon? Gwendolyn, what does this mean? Merely that I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, or physical, physical weakness in the old. Apprised, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the University Extension Scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I've never undeceived him in, in any question. I would consider it wrong. But of course, you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment on this point. As indeed on all our points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon. Algernon! Yes, Aunt Augusta. May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Uh, 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 no, uh, Bunbury doesn't live here. Uh, Bunbury is somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Bunbury? Oh, he was quite exploded. Exploded? <clears throat> Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean he was found out. Uh, the doctors found out that Bunbury could not live. That is what I mean, uh, so Bunbury died. He seems to have had a great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at the last to show some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessarily unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Carter, my ward. Lady Bracknell bows coldly to Cecily. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon? Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. With a shiver, crossing to the sofa and sitting down. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air with this particular part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I, I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information and until yesterday I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. 
Jack looks perfectly furious, but restrains himself. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporden Fifeshire NB. That sounds not unsatisfactory. These are three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bradford. I have known some strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardrew's family solicitors are Messrs. Markby, Markby, and Markby. Markby, Markby, and Markby? A firm of the very highest position in the profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mar Mr. Markby's is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I, I have also in my possession, you will be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles, both the German and the English variety. Ugh. A life crowded with incident, I see. Though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favor of a premature experience. Rises, looks at her watch. Hmm, Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthinger, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. About £130,000 in the funds. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. Sitting down again. A moment, Mr. Worthing. £130,000. And in the funds? Miss Cardew seems to me a, a most attractive young lady. Now that I look at her, few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come here, my dear. Cecily goes across. Pretty child, your dress is sadly simple and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it, but we can soon alter all of that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvelous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing. After three months, her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. Glares at Jack for a few moments, then bends with a practiced smile to Cecily. Kindly turn around, sweet child. Cecily turns completely round. No, 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 the side view is what I want. Cecily presents her profile. Yes. Quite as I expected, there are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin, a little higher, dear. Hmm. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon. Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in all the world. And I don't care two pence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. Dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to, be depend to depend upon. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Ce Cecily, you may kiss me. This is her. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the fourth future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The, the marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. 
<laughs> to speak frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. Um, I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say an ostentationally, ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew, but the fact is that I do not approve at all of his moral character. I suspect, suspect him of being untruthful. Algernon and Cecily look at him in indignant amazement. Untruthful? My nephew, Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brew 89, wine I was specially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. And what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he was perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. Uh, Mr. Worthing, after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. That is very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, some sweet child. Leslie goes over. How old are you, dear? Well, I am really only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looked so calculating. 18. Hmm. But admitting to 20 at evening parties, well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me, Lady Bracknell, for interrupting you again, but it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age till she is 35. <laughs> It does not seem to me a grave, to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women at the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instant in point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not even be, not be even still more attractive at the age you mentioned than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively, but I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I am not punctual myself, I know, but I do like punctuality in others, and waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait till she's 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. Rising and drawing herself up. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. 
then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Pulls out her watch. Come, dear. Gwendolyn rises. We have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Enter Dr. Chasuble. Everything is quite ready for the christening. The christening, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Looking rather puzzled and pointing to Jack and Algernon. Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? The idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I would not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that there was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that if things are now, it will be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chaucerville. I am grieved to, hear, grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savor of the heretical views of the anti-Baptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as your present move seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I'm on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is of the most cultivated of ladies, and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear, I must see her at once. Let her, let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. Enter Miss Prism, hurriedly. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Ken, and I have been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarter. Catches sight of Lady Bracknell, who has fixed her with a stony glare. Miss Prism grows pale and quails. She looks anxiously round, as if desirous to escape. Prism? Miss Prism bows her head in shame. Come here, Prism. Miss Prism approaches in a humble manner. Prism, where is that baby? General consternation. The canon starts back in horror. Algernon and Jack pretend to be anxious to shield Cecily and Gwendolyn from hearing the details of a terrible public scandal. Twenty-eight years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104, Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, though, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more, more than usually revolting sentimentality. Miss Prism starts an in involuntary indignation. But the, but the baby was not there. Everyone looks at Miss Prism. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared, as usual, to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. Where did you deposit the handbag? Oh, do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prison, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? 
Victoria, the bright line. Sinks into a chair. I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. Exit Jack in great excitement. What do you think this means, Lady Brackle? I dare not even suspect Dr. Chorbley, Chaselbeck. And he'd hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. Noise is overheard as if someone was throwing trunks about. Everyone looks up. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It, sound, it sounds as if he's having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They're always vulgar and often convincing. It has stopped now. The noise is redoubled. I wish you'd arrive at some conclusion. This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Bent to Jack with a handbag of black leather in his hand. Is, is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to be mine. Yes, he here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. Here is the stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Leamington. And here on the lock, on my initials, I had forgotten that in an extravagant, extravagant mood I had them placed there. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Embracing her. Yes. Mother. It's Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. I'm, I'm married. I do not deny that it is a serious blow, but after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you. Tries to embrace her again. Mr. Worthing, there is some error. Pointing to Th Lady Bracknell. There is the lady who can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? I am afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief. And consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Algy's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all. I knew I had a brother. I, I always said I had a brother. <laughs> Cecily, how could you have ever doubted that I had a brother? He's the child of Algernon. Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother, Algy, you young scoundrel, you will have to treat me with more respect in the future. You have never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit. I did my best, however, though I was out of practice. Shakes hands. Good, uh, my own. But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Good heavens. I had quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. And I was christened. Had it settled. Now, what name was I given? Let me know the worst. Uh, being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? Hmm. I cannot at the present moment recall what General's Christian name was. But I've no doubt he had one. He was eccentric. I admit, but only in later years, and, and that was the result of the Indian climate, and marriage, and indigestion, 
and other things of that kind. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. His name would appear in the army list of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life, but I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army list of the last 40 years are here. His delightful record should have been my constant study. Rushes to bookcase and tears the books out. Mm, generals. Malum, Maxbohm, Maggie. What ghastly names they have. Markby, Migsby, Mar Monkry. Lieutenant, 1840. Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General, 1869. Christian names. Ernest John. Puts book very gently down and speaks quite calmly. I always told you, Gwendolyn, my name was Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes, I remember now the general was, the general was called Ernest. And you had some particular reason for disliking that name. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first moment that you could have no other name. Oh, Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he had been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? I can, for I feel that you are sure to change. My own one. Letitia. Embrace Fred her. Frederick at last. Cecily. Embrace her. Gwendolyn. Embraces <laughs> My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. <sighs> On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I've now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. A blow. Therapy, you're on mute. Thank you. My dear friends, this has been The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Fingal of Flaherty Wheelers Wild. Reading the Act 3 stage directions was Rebecca Werner. Act 2 stage directions, Sam Negan. Act 1 stage directions was read by Nate Brown. Playing Mirman and saving me our a moment ago, Elon Sofer. Lane was played by Taryn Elizabeth Gray. The Reverend Canon Chaucerbourg was played by Sean Fay. Miss Prism, Tori Smith. Cecily Cardew, Melissa Ragsdale. Gwendolyn Fairfax was played by Melanie Sosi. Jack Worthing, Nick Napo, Algernon, Chris Stewart, Lady Bracknell, Simon Shannon. Special thanks to Meredith Yanuzi for help with assistance with casting. We have been the Zoom players. Thank you and good night. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. <laughs>